My young get it together, you're in the presence of greatness. Hi, you look a bit lost, but I think we just found you. You know how I know? You clicked on this video, reading the title, knowing full well what that title is all about. Seeing the words last meals, seeing that it's about true crime, seeing it's about a military murder, and you were like, this is it. This is the content I need. In that case, I suggest you like this video and you subscribe to the channel because there's plenty in the archive and there's plenty more coming because I don't plan to stop. Okay, now, reduce the intensity, couple of notches. This is last meal, where me, your homegirl, on Fridays I sit down on my fat ass, I have somebody's last meal with me, it will join us later because this person did consume some food, and I tell you about the story about how they got to eat that last special meal, and the bad deed that they have done. And today we are talking about Louis Jones Jr. What I respect about this case is that truly it is about the murder of Tracy McBride and it's all about the victim, which is how every case should be. There's so many cases that are literally glorifying the murderers to the point where the information on the victim is just kind of left behind. Not this one. This one is going to bring back one of my favorite shows from my early teenagehood. I want to say childhood, but it wasn't in his childhood. My parents did not really let me watch this when I was like five, which, I mean, thank you. They did let me watch like Courage the Cowardly Dog, which was equally traumatizing. Okay. It's time. It's time for me to shut the hell up and tell you a story about Louis Jones Jr. and Tracy McBride. This case happened in the 90s, but it was brought back to the public eye in 2019. And why was that? Well, because the US Attorney General at the time, William Barr, cleared the way for the officials to continue capital punishment, and he did this in a way where he directed the Bureau of Prisons to adopt the new execution protocol. So, we spoke about this on one of the earlier episodes. He just basically replaced the free drug cocktail with injections of one single drug. By doing this and planning to execute five people by the end of January 2019, William Barr set in motion what were to be first executions to happen in the US since 2003. Not just that, but the death penalty was only carried out three times in the 56 years prior to 2019. First was done for the domestic terrorist Timothy McVeigh, who I have already spoken about. You have a video on this channel as well, if you're gonna dig through this archive after this video. The second one was Juan Garza, who is a weed trafficker, but he also ordered deaths of two other people. And the third one is the one I will be talking about today, Louis Jones Jr., who was a Gulf War veteran. This last execution happened in San Angelo in Texas in 2003, but eight years before that, the event that will trigger this execution occurred. Tracy McBride was only at a Goodfellow Air Force base in San Angelo for two weeks for advanced intelligence training when she was abducted. So it's a chilly night in February 1995, and Tracy is just in this laundry room on the base, and she is talking for like a receiver to her friend from Minnesota. Her friend, who was on the other end of the line, kind of says what she heard is Tracy got quiet, then she heard another male voice sort of coming from a distance, closer, and then everything got muffled as if somebody covered the phone, covered that lower end of the receiver, and then everything got quiet. Tracy's friend now is one of the two witnesses. Well, she has only witnessed those sounds, but there was somebody who witnessed what was happening in person, who witnessed Tracy's kidnapping. And this was like a fellow soldier on the base who heard Tracy scream and cry for help, and he started running, but the kidnapper was alerted himself and he kind of just like headbutted him with a gun and the soldier fainted on the spot. So this soldier, yes, was a witness but hasn't even seen their facial features or anything because they have just met like the butt of the gun and fell to the ground. So they can't even give enough information for like a composite sketch for the police. Once this soldier regained consciousness and also 
Tracy's friend from Minnesota, they both called the police. They were searching all of the locations where he could have possibly taken her outside, so like different forests, different parks, different green areas, sort of trying to calculate like the radius where she could have been taken during the X amount of time that this soldier was unconscious. So they were searching San Angelo and they actually involved FBI from the get-go. But two weeks pass by, and on March the 1st, they still have no trace of Tracy or whoever has done this. They have not found the body. The trail just seems to have gone cold. That is, until now ex-wife of Louis Jones Jr. walks into the police station and asks to speak to a police officer to report sexual assault. This isn't made clear in any of the articles, but I think even at this point she was the ex-wife, so she has already separated from him and lived at a separate location. But in February, on one evening, the wife claimed that Jones broke into her house, abducted her at gunpoint, asked her to take her credit card, and then brought her to an ATM to withdraw $800 from this ATM, and then brought her back to her home to sexually assault her. So the police brings Louis Jones in for this particular sexual assault and this particular crime. And while they are investigating him completely unaware that he is the guy that is involved with Tracy McBride's abduction, he actually confesses to it himself. And he says he has abducted Tracy on February the 18th and she has been dead since the February 19th. Now, before I tell you what happened on February 18th and the 19th, let's go a bit into the lives of Tracy McBride and Louis Jones Jr. Louis was born on March the 4th, 1950, in Shelby County in Tennessee. There isn't much known about his childhood, but there was this testimony presented at trial that stated that he experienced some sexual and physical abuse when he was a child. But soon after his education, he left to become the Army Airborne Ranger. These are the ones that are involved in the air assault operations, kind of going into different airfields and seizing key terrains, destroying facilities, or capturing and killing the enemies of the nation. He participated in the invasion of Grenada, he participated in the Gulf War, and he was in the army for about 22 years. And like with so many people, this is truly where he excelled. He got all of these medals, commending his work for Gulf War, but also for the attacks in Iraq. He became a master sergeant, but after 22 years of serving in the army, he decided to retire and he was honorably discharged. Of course I'm suspicious of this, but this is the only information I could find online. Why I'm suspicious of this is because why would you, at like the height of your career, without anybody saying, I don't know, you suffer from PTSD or like you have had some long-term consequences, just decide to resign when you're receiving all of these awards for your hard work? Also, why I'm suspicious is because he was still left to work on the base, but not in any position in the army, rather as a bus driver. But still, regardless of my suspicions, this guy never had a criminal record. He was married three times. He had one daughter who he raised, actually, as a single parent. And also one of his three wives was an army staff sergeant. But when it comes to his ex-wife, the one he sexually assaulted days before, she noticed that he got really estranged after he returned from Iraq, whether it was PTSD or whatever she suspected. She just noticed that he wasn't really acting the same. So even before his honorable discharge and just like getting this bus driver job. That is where we meet Louis once Tracy was abducted. Now let's talk about Tracy McBride. I usually dislike when people in documentaries say, uh, this person lit up a room, because it's just overused, like, for every single documentary. But Tracy really was that person. Just by looking at her smile, you're like, yep, that person walked into the room and the energy in the room just escalated, just reached a whole different level. She was the pride and joy of her family. As a young girl, Tracy McBride had a special knack for spreading joy. Always had a smile on her face. Very 
energetic towards life, towards people, and she lived her life with incredible purpose. She liked to bake, and she was a cheerleader for uh, soccer at the high school, and they loved her so much because every week she brought them chocolate chip cookies. Shortly after graduating from high school, Tracy made a surprising and life-changing decision. She made the announcement that she was going to go to, into the Army. We were all completely shocked. She, is good with the she would serve time in the military, and they would pay for her education. She was hoping to have that degree finished before she finished uh, her regulatory duty. Her parents were uneasy. Standing barely five feet tall, Tracy was hardly the typical soldier, but she completed her basic training with flying colors. And even though she had to eat less than wonderful food and be up at ridiculous hours, she just loved it, which is totally in contrast to the girly girl that we knew. In early February of 1995, the 19-year-old was assigned as an Army private to the Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. So Tracy really wanted to become a music teacher one day, but she joined the Army intending to fund her university education. Another thing that is relevant and you should know about Tracy is that she was dating somebody, another U.S. Marine at the time. And so when we meet Tracy, she has just completed her training and was assigned to be at a good fellow base. Now let's pick back up in that interrogation room where Louis Jones just confessed to abducting and murdering Tracy McBride. He didn't just do that, he gave the detectives a location under this bridge that was 27 miles away from San Angelo in Coke County, where they were to find Tracy's body. The police now has his full confession. He confessed to all of the details that we'll speak about in a minute. But this is truly when my childhood hero, my teenagehood hero, really shouldn't be a childhood hero, Dr. G walks in. Have you ever watched Dr. G on like Investigation Discovery or wherever that show was showing? Like this was... There is one documentary, it's called Life Interrupted. I mean, it's Dr. G series and it's one of their episodes that is committed fully to the case of Tracy McBride. This is where, like, I'm getting all the interviews and everything from. But young Dr. G was such a nostalgic teenagehood reminder of my young true crime self that I was like, I was so... I felt immediately connected to this case and I was like, I need to do it because Dr. G walks in. And for those of you who are like, who the hell is she? What are you on about? She was the person to perform autopsy on Tracy. And she has a longish and complicated name to pronounce, that's why they shortened it to Dr. G, because it's Dr. Jen Garavaglia. And at the time, she was the associate medical examiner in Bexar County. I will now put a timestamp on the screen just because I'm aware that not everybody wants to listen to the details of the autopsy and they are quite graphic. So if you don't really want to listen to this, you can skip to the timestamp that you see. I would suggest if you are not like squeamish or sensitive to these details to still listen to them because they're really prevalent and kind of show the cruelty that this guy was willing to go to. Even before undressing her, she notices the shirt is perfectly tucked in, like her shoelaces are perfectly done. It just seems like somebody has posed her that way in the aftermath. Not just that, but even before undressing a person to conduct examination on their body, you kind of need to collect the fibers to see, you know, where they have been, can you locate, like, any carpet fibers, anything that can indicate who has done this to the victim. And Dr. G notices the clothes have been perfectly cleaned. Like, it's completely odd considering a person is wearing them. And also there's no traces that she has been present in, like, a single room. There's just traces of, like, the outside where the body has been laid. 
Now, still before undressing her, Dr. J is looking at her boots. And these boots, even though, yeah, again, shoelaces, perfectly done, but it seems like they have been going through mud very recently, because it just seems like that mud hasn't even dried up for a substantial amount of time. So, Dr. G concludes from this that Tracy was made to walk to her death. And this is when in this documentary, the prosecutor enters and she's like, this is great for me, although it is one of the most morbid things, because now I can fight a death penalty, because it just shows another level of cruelty that somebody actually walked this girl to the place where she was to be executed. She's like, no, this is somebody cruel who is doing everything intentionally. So there's no chance for, like, insanity bullshit. There's no chance for leeways. I'm going for the death penalty. So, this is even before the autopsy technicians undressed her. The prosecution is like, no, case closed. Like, whatever you tell me next, I'm fighting for the death penalty on this one. But Dr. G is not done yet. So, now looking from what she can see, obviously, Chase is in the uniform, she can see her hands are kind of mummified. Like, you can see, I don't want to say skin slippage, but almost there. It's kind of like in a stage of decomposition. So, she kind of gets scared, like, uh, if this is the case of, you know, the body under the uniform, if it's already in the stages of decomposition, I might not get what I'm looking for, which is the proof of sexual assault, which is DNA, which is what she's really after. But after she undresses Tracy, she realizes that won't be a problem. Like, her body was perfectly preserved. Which leads me to say, he fucked up without knowing he fucked up. This is why I love these cases, because by exposing her, where he exposed her, in a very remote area, where nothing or nobody is to disturb this body, it meant that Tracy's body was well-preserved. Dr. J and other autopsy technicians counted nine blows to her head. So, this was vicious. And they established that the weapon looked like a tire iron. So, something elongated, but kind of sharp, because one side of her face was even more severely damaged. So, from that side, they could kind of tell, like, what weapon was used in particular. And another saddening fact that they could tell was that it happened to her when she was alive. Now that the victim is undressed, Dr. G is obviously looking into proving rape. And as I told you, like, it won't be too hard because the body wasn't in, like, some severe stages of decomposition. But what I find so eerie and so creepy is that Tracy, even though she was, like, fully dressed from the outside, wasn't wearing any underwear. And no underwear was found on the site of the murder. Meaning that he either kept it for himself and then disposed of it, or he just kept it somewhere in his flat. While examining her, these autopsy technicians deduce that she has been raped. They see all these bruises in different colors, technically painting a picture of exactly how it happened. But because the body was meticulously clean, even without the clothes, there was absolutely no DNA on her. This could have meant a couple of different things. Either that the perp didn't ejaculate, or that the perp used something like an object instead. Another thing that they could tell by doing the rape examination is that Tracy fought back. So, they saw the bruises, they saw that she fought back, so Dr. G was like, okay, I can fight for rape here. But if you remember, Tracy had a boyfriend, so this could have very well just been rough sex. So, they had to exclude the boyfriend first. After the police investigators managed to clear her boyfriend, they started matching up Dr. G's report, with Jones's confession. If you remember, he literally confessed to everything. So, let's see how the two meet and what was the timeline of this story. On the night of the attack, after that phone call that got muffled, Jones took Tracy to his house where he raped her. He actually made her go inside the closet as well. In order to preserve the evidence, the way Dr. G described, he asked her to take all of her clothes off. So, he washed her clothes 
and then he asks her to wash her body in hydrogen peroxide. And while waiting for like her clothes to dry and while washing herself, she had to just walk on towels so that she wasn't leaving her DNA behind and also so that nothing would transfer on her. After doing all of this, he walked Tracy to this remote location of his choice where she inevitably must have known what was about to happen to her. And apart from her body, they found a pair of her glasses as well next to her, which they speculated had fallen off her face under the impact of the tire iron. So now we go to trial. And the prosecution is happy. They're like, I don't care that we don't have DNA. We have an evil person that confessed to everything. Like, literally, he can't withdraw any of this. He confessed the murder weapon. He confessed where it has happened. He confessed how he has done it. So we have the intention and we have the level of cruelty to fight the death penalty. But his defense team claimed a couple of things. Well, they have claimed he was brought up in this abusive household the war has changed him, and they believe that he was a victim of Gulf War Syndrome. We'll talk about that in a second. But they also said that the investigators never managed to retrieve the tire iron, the murder weapon, nor did they manage to retrieve the gun that Tracy was abducted from the base with. Also, of course, what went for their client was he had a stellar record. Commendations, medals, no issues, no criminal record ever in the past. And he managed to keep a steady job, regardless of him being honorably discharged from the army. What his defense team said went into his favor were two things. One was that Jones actually disposed of the gun in this dumpster. Then the police could never find this gun. But he disposed of it because he actually was delusional and wanted to kill himself a couple of days after Tracy's murder. But also, what they now contradicting the prosecution who is saying, that Jones actually confessed that he wanted to kidnap his ex-wife, but couldn't find her. So he went for Tracy instead on that occasion, and then later, as we know, he did abduct and sexually assault his own ex-wife. Well, but they have said that this has happened because for Louis Jones, this was the out-of-body experience. That he saw black smoke the way he saw it in Kuwait when he was on the ground in the force, and he also heard Satan laugh, and that's why he did it. The judge actually at first decided not to show the jurors the pictures of the victim because he said it's going to traumatize you, like it's too gruesome. But in the end, the jurors deliberated and they asked for them to see the pictures in order to make a decision. A quick note on the jury, nine of them were female and three of them were male. And there was only one black female juror and she was said to have broken down herself and said that she is against death penalty. She doesn't believe the death penalty is appropriate in this case. And she has later admitted publicly as well, and like once they discussed it with Judge, I suppose, they had to say, you know, were they ever hung or like who was pro, who was against. And she was the one to have later caved after the pressure of the other members of the jury. So in the first trial, they find him guilty. And then upon the second trial, it only took them six and a half hours to decide that Louis Jones deserved a death penalty. And another quick note here, and this is why I kind of love and respect McBride family. And you know my views by now when it comes to death penalty. I think they should rot in prison, except that one Japanese case that I covered on the podcast of Twitter Killer. But I was like, well, actually, when they're the worst of the worst, they should be kind of receiving the Japanese version of death penalty, which is that they don't know the day that they die. They just get alerted one day and then... It's every day, it's a mental torture for them. But here, sideline, Tracy's family was always for the death penalty. From the get-go, they said, no, this is what we want. And this is why I love and respect them, like, even in this Dr. G episode, they just, there's no, like, dramatization. They're like, no, Tracy's was our pride. This man was vile. He deserves a death penalty. This is it. There's no, like, over-dramatization over anything. Like, I respect this family. And I think 
family's wishes should be respected and heard when it comes to death penalty cases by jury at least if not like us in retelling the story as armchair detectives definitely by jury because if the family is pro death penalty then the jury should take that into consideration the same way when it comes if they are really against it and like really don't want the person that i don't know killed their loved one to die i again think that we should consider that. If you remember from the beginning of the video, I said it took eight years between the crime and the day of Jones's execution. Now, why is that? Well, because of appeals. Jones appealed on a variety of different things, including racial discrimination, selective prosecution of death penalty cases, and he also believed that his counsel defense was bad, which is like the most common one that they used. Oh, the counsel was inadequate and they didn't represent me well, I had shitty lawyers. But here his lawyers knew, like, okay, the racial line is just not strong enough. It's something people have tried multiple times before. We need an angle. And you, sir, you have an angle because you fought in all of these wars. And no, we're not talking about PTSD. We're talking about Gulf War Syndrome or a nerve gas appeal. This came about because in December 2000, the Pentagon actually informed Jones that himself, among other 130,000 soldiers, may have been exposed to low levels of nerve gas while fighting in Iraq in 1991. And according to the experts that they have now consulted for his appeals, this Gulf War syndrome is characterized by the damage it does to the region of the brain that regulates person's moods, emotions, and impulse control. And this would then in turn explain why he was suddenly violent and just looking for any victim. So if it wasn't his ex-wife, it would have been Tracy. If it wasn't Tracy, it would have been somebody else because he just couldn't make rational decisions any longer. So his attorney asked a medical board to review his medical records. And they conclude, quote, In my opinion, Jones Gulf War service involved chemical exposures that caused brain cell damage to deep brain structures. The site where this brain cell damage happened was responsible for the personality changes that contributed significantly to the tragic events of the crime. So I looked a bit into nerve gas, what you can do to treat it, what is like commonly known about it, and how do people know it's like only mildly affected somebody or somebody has just been exposed to, I don't know, a whiff of nerve gas compared to like, no, they're literally like right next to it, inhaling it. And it's so infuriating because I will now tell you a couple of bits of information, but the true conclusion is that there's not insane amount of research done and this well happens on the reg during the war, apparently. What we know about it is that between 95 and 2005, the health of those combat veterans compared to the ones that were never deployed worsened. So there's definite connection saying that those who have been exposed to nerve gas in war have suffered through some health consequences as a result of that. This could have included the onset of different chronic diseases, repeated clinic visits and hospitalization, chronic fatigue, PTSD, and just greater persistence of some adverse health incidents. But even though Gulf War veterans report to be failing sick twice as often as other veterans, 224 different studies that the federal government has conducted investing $212 million to conduct the same studies, have not found any kind of causal link between illnesses and service in the Gulf. How it's dealt with, where they're given this drug called PB. So when combat veterans are within war, they can take this drug, but it's a very limited amount that they should be taking. But then during these studies, they have actually found out that these soldiers have been taking huge amounts of this drug PB, trying to build immunity, which is just not how it works. And obviously, that drug is quite new, so it has side effects. And also PB was then afterwards used in another war with Iraq, so they're just not removing that and just blaming it on the individuals rather than looking at the bigger issue that we have here. 
As for after the war, you should be receiving therapies, receiving cognitive behavior therapy or CBT, or taking doxycycline. I've read like different accounts for this, but there's no showcase that Louis Jones has done any of this either. Also, when I looked into it, if you remember, there was one digit which was over 100,000 soldiers that have been affected with this Gulf War syndrome, and yet I think we would have heard if over 100,000 people suddenly after war were on a rampage committing crimes. I have a feeling we would have known about it. We would have known that these are all war veterans that are suddenly committing crime. What I'm driving at is how calculated this was, that this isn't just something every army veteran, every soldier has ever done. He wanted to attack his ex-wife. He couldn't find his ex-wife. He attacked her. He was armed for an attack. He brought her to her house. He could have stopped at any of these cases. He made Tracy walk on fibers. He tried to conceal his DNA. He dressed her himself like he washed her clothes. He brought her to a remote area, which seemed pre-planned as well. He made sure his DNA is not on her in any way, shape, or form. And another thing, Gulf War ended in 1991. So for four years, he was just living his life as normal. Or if he wasn't, well, then he should have been looking for therapy. Or the organization should have provided him with some therapy for PTSD, for this Gulf War syndrome to be looked into. I'm not saying he's the only one to blame, but I'm saying this is a lot more calculated and we would have probably heard if many other people experiencing this exact same syndrome have been committing these kind of crimes. So where did this lead in the particular case we're talking about today and his appeals? The prison officials allowed for blood tests, but not the MRI scan, because that would require him to, like, move hospitals and go to, like, a civilian one, and they were shit scared that he was gonna commit this again. But once they had done these blood tests, they found out that he was more susceptible to this nerve gas than an average person. This test revealed he had really low levels of this enzyme that naturally protects our brains from any chemical agents, including the nerve gas. And his lawyers in these appeals said, I'm only looking for his sentence to be commuted to life in prison. I don't mind. He can rot in prison. It's fine. He admitted guilt. He never suddenly turned around and said he wasn't guilty. He admitted responsibility. So we just want life in prison. But you know who shared my opinion when it comes to Gulf War and not all of the soldiers committing the crime? Chase's family, yeah. They went on television. They went on ABC's Good Morning America. They're like, no, we are not fucking around with these appeals. You, sir, deserve a death penalty. Her mother, Irene, said, I think it's an excuse. There's a lot of people that go to the Gulf War and don't come back and murder people. I think that there is no reason that a criminal should be able to look at their past or their present not to change what they did. It's not about the criminal, it's about the crime. And Tracy's sister Stacy said, I don't want him living in a prison where he can watch cable TV, lift weights, go to the library, eat, sleep, talk to his family. Where was the mercy when Tracy pleaded? He refused to have any lenience on her. That was the longest way of saying his appeal has been denied. So now he had one last chance to appeal for clemency from the president himself. But federal prosecutors and McBride family actually opposed this clemency appeal and they submitted their documents to the Supreme Court and to Bush's administration at the time, saying this is bullshit because actually we found out looking at his records that he has been proven to be violent even before he was in Gulf War. On four different occasions, our boy Louis Jones actually attacked different soldiers. That is why it has taken eight years, but finally, on March 17, 2003, the Supreme Court rejected his last appeal. And they waited no longer. The next day, March 18, 2003, he was woken up bright and early to have his last meal. So now, let me excuse me while I prepare his last meal. I'll be here. I'll be back in a minute. Ta-da! So let's talk about what do we have here. We have peaches, we have nectarines, and we have plums. And all of them look exactly the same. I know, because none of them are, like, really in season. And also, I live in the UK, so life. 
So on March 18th, he was given the choice to have his last meal. He chose peaches, nectarines, and plums. And then he was escorted to meet up with his daughter one last time, and then was escorted to this hall with a gurney where he was to receive a lethal injection. I hate when they choose for the last meals the things that I actually like to eat, because I'm like... You made right choices at certain points in your life. Why couldn't you make them all throughout? Okay. In his last moments, Louis chose to show his personality. He was never looking towards Trace's family. He just simply turned his head towards the different side of that observation room. His last words were, Although the Lord have chastised me for, he had not given me over unto death. He then began to sing this hymn with the chorus of In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. And then he was declared dead at 7.08 a.m. at the age of 53. I'm gonna finish that later because this requires my full attention. After his execution, the 10 relatives and family members of McBride family addressed the media and they were wearing the badges with Tracy's face on them. Stacy, her sister, said, the tears we have shed today are not for Louis Jones, they are for Tracy and Tracy alone. And Stacy was quite surprised that he didn't even look at them. He did not even acknowledge they were there in the room. She said he did not even acknowledge us. The whole thing was very self-serving. It was unbelievable. So we are left with the questions of why? What motivated this guy to just snap out of it that day and just decide like he is looking for a victim and he will find one? Could it have been the nerve gas? Sure, it could have affected him to a certain degree. But then again, we have disputed that so many soldiers could have also been affected to a certain degree and yet hundred thousands of them have not committed the same crime. Something that Stacey McBride actually said stuck with me, and that is that last comment of self-serving. I think, as I mentioned, he was just looking to harm somebody. And I think the roots are in this, like, honorable discharge moving on to being a bus driver. Because this is the guy that was commended, that was given all these awards and medals, and suddenly he needs to work at the same place, probably being surrounded by the same people that have seen him as this decorated army veteran, and now he's driving a bus. He drives those people around there talking about the excitement of the army. He drives people around there probably like kind of addressing him and maybe looking down on him. And I can't imagine that he was too happy about that position. But also hearing all of these stories, if he actually did suffer from Gulf War syndrome, from PTSD, it is again just enhanced by him prolonging his time in this environment. He's not like honorable discharged, got his retirement, he's now chilling at home and like in his garden. He's still on the army base, he's still just driving those people just in a demoted position. So in my personal opinion, I think he was then fixated to try at least control somebody's life for a split second, because he wasn't in charge of this part of his own life any longer. So let's end this video on a positive note and truly the memory and the legacy of Tracy McBride. In the aftermath of her death, her parents created a Tracy Joy McBride Scholarship Fund and its associated event, Tracy's Night, were named after her. Often, her mother Irene reminisces and tries to imagine what her daughter's life would have been. She's picturing whether Tracy would have married the Marine that she was dating in 1995. She sees her teaching the music to the children, babysitting seven nieces and nephews that were born after her death, and helping her sister prepare for her wedding. And before I finish this last meal, let me just finish with a paragraph that I found on Tracy's foundation page, because I don't know how to end this video on a better note. Though her physical life ended, her family recognized that her life painted a picture of using life not for personal gain, but rather for the purpose of bringing quality and joy to others, thereby naturally increasing the quality of one's own life. This was her legacy that could influence people for years to come. And that, ladies and gents, is the story of the murder of Tracy McBride. 
I will see you all next week. And until then, keep appreciating your next meal as if it was your last. Mm -hmm.